gradual information on his lands uh, gallery stands, uh, original culture custodians and land custodians, and all of the knowledge of those past, present, and future uh, here and there before we begin our incredible um, panel discussion this morning with featured uh, West of Central artists, Jim Gollum, Kevin Graham, Jason Graham, and Maddie Gibbs. Uh, facilitating conversation with uh, Associate Curator Extraordinaire, Ben Finnegan. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We're all in good spirits because we had a good party last night. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, thank you for coming along. This will be uh, an in conversation, um, nice and relaxed, but I do hope uh, that we can get into some, some meaty stuff as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, we'll have question time uh, at the at the end, um, and for the thirty to forty five minutes um, coming uh, uh, of coming, we will be chatting uh, amongst ourselves. So, um, so just sit back, enjoy, and uh, and then gather gather all those questions for the end because uh, because we'll have some time for that as well. So, Anna, I'll just uh, begin with you to open up the uh, opening things up. I thought we'd like to speak of with a very brief introduction to each of the works. Hello everyone. Um, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the variety of people from our new slave movement today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our ancestors who um, have fought the fight for us to tell these stories and practice culture today on country. Um, I am a new Mark Chilwin, grew up in Dubbo, New South Wales, uh, Rotary Country. Uh, and I live in Kendos, in old Rotary Country, <coughs> and make work about the city and skin. Um, so the one that I created for this show is called Something in the Water. Um, uh, that's the work. Uh, so uh, we paint thousands of, uh, of fish. Um, the work is about the many fish kills. Um, my great grandmother was born on the bar a bit further up when the fish kills happened. And um, this work is an honouring of the fish, um, of the people. Um, I think the work would be saying that we are not separate or not better than or not more important than the fish. And um, I feel like we're all coming to the same point uh, in terms of climate catastrophes. Um, and the political system that we're currently in. Um, so, yeah, the work draws you in from its beauty and then hits you with the story of the planet and the sky. Uh, hi, I'm Jason Lee. Uh, I'm a descendant of the Bureau of Mom. I also have uh, Cantonese uh, ancestry, Australian ancestry, whatever that is. These days. Um, yeah, I'd also like to acknowledge Ram Raja Country. Um, uh, it's a great privilege to you know, be making work and living on Raja Country. It's a very special place. Um, and uh, this, this is my work uh, behind us here. Um, uh, well, it's a community work. Um, and yeah, I guess it just I don't know how to describe it simply, but for intro, but we'll get into that. Um, but it's basically the consequences of still being on um, stolen land and how that echoes today. Hello, everyone. I'm Caitlin Graham. I'm from Lowrine and I did a Bachelor of Fine Arts at the National Art School and I finished that last year and I moved back home. Um, my work is the one out in the foyer of the power station being demolished. Um, the work is sort of about the community and what the power station means. It's not a diminishing coal industry, it's a celebration of the 70 years of service and all the people that have worked there, the people that have constructed it. You talk to anyone in the community, they know someone that's worked there or worked through it or works in it. Mine, the whole community relies on coal mining, coal fired power, and sort of celebrating that. And yeah, that's 
Can you watch what that means there? Hi, my name is Jean Holland. Uh, I grew up in Orange. Um, and uh, apart from a time when I was in school, where I studied print making at Southern Cross University, I uh, have been doing work when we were doing that at that full time. Um, and it's just the most incredible part of the world to be living and making art in. Uh, and my work is down in the middle rooms uh, at the back of the gallery. Uh, it's called Past, Present, and Continuous. Uh, and it's a work that has been under construction in some ways for close to two decades. Um, and started with a uh, bee, uh, plate polished plastic bee collection that uh, was found in the shed of an uh, rural property up in Lismore. And the woman who had collected those beads over quite a number of years had been um, uh, moved into a nursing home. And we started a big sort of uh, attempt, I guess, to, to reconnect that collection uh, with the woman. We thought that potentially it had been uh, left in the shed and sort of forgotten, but um, the family uh, just were really interested in the collection and were like, oh, that's just there because like, we've got to take it to the tip. Um, and I guess like from that moment, that collection sort of became, I guess, a bit of a symbol, I guess, for the disappearing histories of women in rural New South Wales, and particularly, um, you know, the crafting that in some ways built a lot of small communities. So, there is always uh, the remnants of craft practice in small communities, and often the really sort of low crafts or the nylon knitting ribbon um, and the flame polished uh, plastic works, um, they were often held in high esteem, but they were made by people uh, and sold at local fates, and they helped to build hospitals and education services and all of those um, things that really allow for you know, rural communities to flourish. Um, and I think that, you know, we are losing a lot of uh, histories and this work is really, I guess, about, you know, those places that we are um, not at risk of, but, you know, there is a lot of, you know, artists moving out this way, which is fantastic, but there is a lot of people moving out to the regions and there, um, you know, there is going to be a lot of change in the regions over, you know, the next, years, I mean, you can see even within Bathurst, there's a major construction happening uh, down at Tremainsville, which is where this work was made, um, and it's going to be economically quite good for Bathurst, um, but it will forever change um, the landscape and the history of that side. Um, yeah, this brings me to this um, concept of nostalgia, and this is short, this is nostalgia for um, places in the community. And I can see this as a strain across so many works, you know, your work, you know, your work, um, many days and many days that have been. And I've got mixed emotions about this. And I really would like to talk about sort of the uh, concept of that. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it hits close to home because I feel like it's a loss of culture that's happening. Um, you know, with these works on the river, like, obviously there was a drought that happened before this and then the floods, but then the mismanagement of the water system. But with this system, water is our life, and we, you know, where we, where Aboriginal people are born. <coughs> I mean, where Aboriginal people born, um, trade routes, uh, food, medicine, resources, stories, like that is the main, you know, that's, that's everything for Aboriginal culture. Um, so if that's being mistreated, mismanaged, um, like that's, that's us dying with the river. Um, and the fish as well. Um, so it's terrifying. It's um, it's really worrying that, that our, our water systems are being treated like that, being sold. Um, and I don't know, I feel like the communities out there don't have a voice that they're, yeah. that they're, being listened to, they're not being listened to. So um, I just remember um, Bates, you know, being in that area of the 
know the amount of things I'm not going to say. Thank you very much. It's a very, very nice talk. That was good. Yeah. Another very good country. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this is the rework. Do you have to talk for more to just and the problems is my rebuilding, just in terms of that place? Yeah, for sure. So, so um, Bernie and I, we're, we're local residents in Candles. Um, and, uh, you know, we, start, we invest in everything. You know, we move to the community for, um, you know, wider arts community support. Um, invest in everything, and then overnight, um, there was a, a, the largest open pub in mine in New South Wales, just approved. Um, so, and then everything changes, like, in an instant. Which I think is it's largely indicative of, of every other sort of problem I think we're, we're living in a world where we can't feed our own population. Um, we don't have clean water. Um, yeah, it's pretty concerning. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, it's, I mean, this, this is the dominant model. You know, is it working? I know if we can't feed our own population uh, or drink clean water. Whereas you, know, you have you know, land management for 100,000 years plus, um, and then the Industrial Revolution is a big turning point. Capitalism, ego, power, corruption, uh, and here we are. Um, but you know, we make noise about it along the way. Um, so I guess as an artist, you know, whilst we do have a voice, it's a limited voice, um, that you know, we are minorities, minorities, minorities. Um, however, you know, our artworks in institutions like this, um, in the press, and engaging with the community and, and amplifying our voice for what's disappearing, uh, definitely helps. And so, um, you know, whilst I feel like, you know, we are in a hopeless situation, um, but I'm hopeful and, um, you know, we need to try and make change along the way. So, I mean, I think we're all aware of the devastating effects of mining um, and, and other oppressive, you know, systemic. Can I just interject a bit and draw attention to a little of the sand bank? This represents, you know, 40,000 years or more. You know, continues. Um, you just come studying the shape of the land in the center, that's 40,000 years ago. This second ring in the middle is the 19th century, you know, colonization, and you'll see uh, deforestation, you'll see the introduction of salt, you know, the introduction of mismanagement of the land, increasing salinity, and all those um, seeds which may start to sprout over the two coming months. Uh, they represented the introduced, you know, um, species of grain crops, etc. And that, of course, um, relates back to uh, Bruce Pascoe with the other room. Keep bringing back indigenous agriculture, you know, the young days in Vernon. So that kind of contestation is taking place in that uh, middle ring. And on the outer ring, we have the introduction of big mining, and we've seen what that has done in Newcastle. We've seen what that's done, you know, in North Mudgee. And now they're very nervous about those um, mining leases <coughs> all over this valley, all over this, the plains, um, particularly, you know, the Fudgee on the and Candos. Um, and, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk about um, soil nostalgia. Yeah, yeah um, so sort of one thing about like my life is I started creating it um sort of like being in Sydney while I was thinking a lot of people around me hadn't seen a coal mine, hadn't seen a power station and like all the big bad terrible things that destroy the environment but uh, and I was sort of like what do the people that see it every day that work in these places actually think so I sent out testimonials to local Facebook groups in the chat and what sort of come back was sort of the people who sort of like they're not as bad as they seem, they're not 
quite <laughs> absolutely devastating to what people express them to be. And it's, um, it's more of a, um, like it's providing for community, it's providing for Australia. And people, when they saw the power station come down, like a lot of people were very happy to see it go, but a lot of people were sad to see it go, which was the type of people were sad to see it go. Um, it sort of leaves a lot of questions for the community because if this is our livelihood, like that power station wasn't demolished because it wasn't needed, it was often outdated, and that's part of the story. They actually added a new unit that now title the power station on the road, I believe. But um, it's sort of like that landmark for the community, like that's been there my whole life. You can see it from my house, you can see it from my brother's house, and then in an instant it's gone. And it's sort of like, where does that leave us? Like, there's a lot of criticism and questions facing our community. Everyone's sort of like hating on our livelihoods. And it's like, well, what do you want us to do? What's going to happen if you do say, let's get rid of all these industries? Like, it sort of leaves a lot of open space and a lot of questions. Like, where does it leave us in our community? Unanswered questions. Yeah. I think the reality is, and a really good point up here, Caitlin, and, um, you know, I should mention as, as emerging artists, it's really important for us to see, I guess, a cross spectrum of practice engaging at different levels and uh, at the different times throughout, throughout practices, but also at different levels and stages and places in communities and the building issues that we're facing right now. And one point that you made up really, really important is that. Yes, there's a lot of you know, contentious and, and intense feelings levelled at individuals who are left with no other choice in a scenario, rather than, I guess, addressing those that are probably more responsible for what it is that we're doing and how we create jobs and what we provide for a community in the way of income earning options um, and education training, all those sorts of things. And so, um, so it is quite, it's a wonderful perspective to get of individual people, what they're doing and what they cannot then do yeah. when all of that is, is taken away. What is happening here in mind is what's happening with our, our energy and industries generally. That's a hugely important discussion and one that I think that um, Jason and Matt particularly are very, very passionate about. We're all very passionate about. And it's also really important um, for us to, to think about what, it, what happens if you, when you haven't provided you know, other options. Yeah, and that's sort of like, like I'm not an expert, but I've tried to do a fair bit of research. Like, why I think it's not really any alternatives to coal, like this, like, it's efficient, it's reliable, it's sustainable, it's cheap, like, there's no other form of energy besides probably oil or nuclear that would be able to replace it. So, um, yeah, the sort of the questions of, is it perfect for the environment? No, it's not, it has its issues. But, like, um, in those testimonials I sent out, the people that responded that, um, from the area, all that hadn't seen it, they were always concerned with the environment. People that live in the area or have worked there, uh, from memory, not one person mentioned concern for the environment. They were more concerned about jobs. And if the people that see it every day aren't that concerned about the environmental impacts, are the environmental impacts really that bad? This sort of the questions that that left me thinking. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also on the um, passing to the nature of the farm to really changed. You know, Candos is peppered with these tiny little lines and uh, these big open cut lines are a really different thing to the you know, the very honourable tradition of going down the you know, current the nation. And uh, there's a really as you say, the question came to our community just to be attached to those systems. I remember Ian Miller's speech from the Larrow Way, um, he did a big project with the and people were, were very attached 
and the time from the mines still might be a ratio of the coal delivered every winter to their houses because it's their part of their tradition and their way of life. And due to this nostalgia, uh, this is uh, such an interesting um, discussion making because it really speaks to the complex views of many of these really you know, smaller communities and regional communities. And I think it's something that you know, spent the best work in Canvas, like has been some of the most interesting conversations, is working out how you know, these different opposing views can sort of you know, work together in some ways. I mean, I um, made a work uh, about uh, roadkill, uh, which is something that I just, you know, I've been doing my entire life. Like, a kangaroo at the side of the road just still just rips my heart out every time. And I kind of can't believe we kind of, you know, worked out how to get from place to place without killing native apples. Um, but I'm also, my sister is you know, married to a farmer, and uh, they shoot kangaroos. And, you know, I, you know, it's this kind of bone of contention and argument that's been like taken off the table at Christmas. Like, it's like, you can come out and you, but like, can you leave the kangaroos? <laughs> and, like, we're up for any other conversation, but like, you're really, you know, you're not making any friends. Um, and, you know, I really love those conversations because I think, you know, they have to be had in some ways. Um, and, yeah, our life is changing all the time. I think Jason, when you were installing the work, you were talking about the sort of threat to the region and the upcoming threats of mining, but um, it does feel like the region's always been on the threat in a lot of ways. Like, it's not, these are not new things, and by all of this thing here in the audience, it's part of the River Yarns, which is one of the groups that really protested against the Macquarie being really quite, um, and that was the water, and I think, you know, the drought, um, which is something that I feel like a lot of uh, people have, you know, quickly forgotten, but, you know, there was a lot of uh, years there when we were all running out of water, um, and, you know, it was a water risk management, and, you know, just also the fact that it didn't <laughs> um, and, you know, had a massive impact on the mental health of people living right at the state. Um, so I haven't really spoken to us about it, but I do want to just speak to you this conversation because I do think Really uh, that's excellent. They were asked to what extent the work were determined by the spirits of the place. And I think you've all already answered that question very, very well. Um, so moving on, um, my next one is um, artists as transceivers. This is a bit of a new uh, word to uh, enter the theoretical discussion about the place. Um, it's the idea of um, artists or whatever. Um, Coming the medium of exchange between city and country. You know, um, this transmission of ideas. I know a lot of you, all of you, move between city and country do so regularly. And uh, clearly, your excursions go the west. And so I thought I'd um, start with you, Maddie um, and, and Jason. Uh, I know you've been engaged in your projects at the Orange. I'm just interested to hear how that experience went. There's really uh, uh, web connections across the central west. We have places as part of the idea behind this exhibition. Yeah. Um, Sydney just becomes a bubble, um, and when we moved to Kendos, one of our like goals was to like get out of that, but also like take our artworks back to the city and let people know what's happening out here. Um, so like part of our Work is like we travel out to Wellington, Dubbo, um, Mount Black Ridge, Orange, and consult with Aboriginal communities, um, talk to them about what's happening in their towns because it's so different in each place, um, have those conversations, spend time, build those relationships, um, and like often try and train young people. Um, obviously, there's not as much opportunity, and, um, and we want young artists to be able to have those voices in those places. Um, and yeah, that's a huge part of it. Um, it's a privilege to be, to be able to travel around and, and meet all those people, but I think it's like a huge part of it is taking them back to Sydney. Like I took this work to Mossman Gallery and I still feel like it's so relevant in that place. Um, you know, at the opening, someone said to me, oh, like I was like, I'm so confident it's here, like this is the audience that I want it to be in. And she was like, oh, like, Offended that I that I said that and I was like and she and 
sort of like made me feel like I was in the wrong for, um, you know, like bringing that there, but also saying that Mossman is a bubble. Um, so um, I was like, this is the audience that you know has the power to make change. You live in a place where you can afford not to have gold mines in your area, so they move into poorer suburbs or you know push people out. Um, so uh, I feel lucky to be able to tell those stories. Um, yeah. I'm very upset, yes. So the idea of um, the artist as, as transceiver, as the beautiful, I think comes back to this, um, one of the underpinning thinkings and thoughts um, behind this exhibition it was that we don't want to talk about um, regional artists or city artists, we want to talk about spaces of activation, spaces of issues, yes, but, uh, issues and concerns of our times, including the very front and centre mining question in this area are uh, specific to place, very, very importantly so. However, when we talk about practices and artists, we're not talking about space, just geolocalised and that's it, you know, because practices really do extend beyond borders, even if you have the issue that's localised, it will find echo and resonance elsewhere, and that is the great beauty and magic of artists and Jason mentioned before that you know we're a minority of a minority of a minority in the arts and it can really feel like that sometimes but I also do feel like that because we have also the, um, the great benefit of public spaces and we get to use those public spaces the way that we want to use those public spaces um, the arts has this really incredible power to it as well um, and artists get to be the truth tellers, the soothsayers, the uh, change agitators um, of our time too. So, uh, and they're witnesses. You're all witnesses more than anything. And so, um, and so you, you have this incredible power, which is why we're here today too, to talk about these issues and how they find their sense in different places, take them to different places, as you say, Nelly. See how they land, and sometimes they land, and sometimes they don't. Um, but that, that's also information. That's good. That's good learning, you know. And we, we work out where and why um, our work is so needed. Yeah, and more. Yeah. Good question. There. I'll hand over to Jason. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm quite lucky. I, I get to sort of live in both worlds. Um, but um, I, I grew up. Did in South West, Bankstown, you know, um, along George's River, and then in the city, kind of after that. Um, and I guess, you know, I see that city, city Metro gets, you know, largely most of the funding. Um, however, uh, they're producing very ordinary um, below par results for um, unlimited resources, for networks, funding corporate partnerships, all of that. So, you know, it's 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 centres and communities, uh, the, the regional galleries and uh, they are satellite hubs which you need to radiate, but that the exchange has to go both ways. I mean we, which is I mean we're lucky because we're new locals now, but but now that we are locals, I mean you know these satellite hubs, I mean you get to capitalise on their experience, you know I mean? We have, um, you know, I get asked to advise and consult in about six, six different art centres um, from a whole, anywhere from ministers to, you know, people on street from murals. And um, yeah, it's important to build that, that these satellite hubs and people can radiate and also to other smaller towns. Um, problem is, is that regional doesn't get a big chunk of funding. So that's the, the, the hub can't expand it unless it's funded properly, but also it won't succeed unless the community actually activates and mobilizes to, to you know, do a lot of work. Um, so you know, for us, we feel really privileged. We get to share our professional practice and ensure that we can do things to help facilitate that. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, I find the work out here so much more interesting. You know, it's like. When you're out sort of in the central west, like you're talking about something, you know, like, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not really inspired by like our way to see the city, you know. Um, whereas sort of our way to see the real, like saying something, you know. Yeah. Uh, is there a place in the Yeah, but yeah, time, space, place is everything. Um, you know, unfortunately for us as Aboriginal people, no matter where we go, just being Aboriginal is a political act, I guess, or not being political is a political act. So we're protesting every day, it's like a lived experience, it doesn't matter where we go. Um, but, um, yeah, it informs the word, but to get back to the point, yeah, it's a local problem, um, but it's a human problem. Again, we can't feed our population in that kind of order. You know, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, we need, that, you know, communities need work, you know, and all of that, but it's like, you know, there's no safe way to contain toxic waste. It has been proven anywhere around the world. Um, I'm aware that, like, we need, we need, uh, Minerals for our iPhones, laptops, and all of that stuff. But the fact that we don't have a better way now is concerning. Um, yeah, and it's interesting to tell people that we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. The system is for them to do the waste, is what we do. It's not part of the approvals process. But that's also an opportunity for non student people to do jobs. You know, if there's a group of people will be. You know, to actually address those issues rather than under the carpet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think they better hurry up. I mean, you know, some, some, you know, somebody said to me, you know, we have 18 summers left, you know, and, you know, if you think that, you know, you know, MIT estimated that in 2015, um, Blue green out in photoplankton in the, in the sea, which most people don't know, but most of our oxygen doesn't come from trees, it comes from the ocean. And um, with the so 80% of our oxygen from the ocean. With all the commercial fishing, you know, it's, it's destroying the biodiversity, which can't produce that. So it's now moved from 2000, uh, sorry, 2050 to 2040. And that's that, that's a conservative uh, estimate, uh, and um, I mean that's eighteen summers left. So if you think about eighteen Christmases, and eighty percent of our oxygen disappears, that's a problem. You know, so so you know this this you know providing power the fact we don't have a sustainable, clean, safe way. Uh, it's, it's very concerning. Yeah, um, so maybe I'll take the paper after that. It's really pretty hard to respond to, you know, the science is out there. Um, but um, nonetheless, there's a lot of work to be done just in terms of um, working with the community, you know, just in terms of addressing the way this change is you know. Um, I guess we sort of like uh, those adjustments, you know, how does the community come to make those adjustments? And alongside as you say, there's this um, new unit coming in at uh, Mount Hyper. There's also the batteries coming in at uh, Mount Hyper as well. So that for a while, I guess these two kind of um, economic systems or environmental systems are going to exist side by side, and there's a sort of massive collision course there. And you know, there's a big space for negotiation. So I'm just wondering, would you like to talk about your experiences moving between the National Arts School and here, and how you had to negotiate those conversations? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think sort of the trend is everyone telling, oh yes, the rooms will be all behind the rooms, so I um, think everyone's banking on that to be happening. Um, if we, if the whole planet was to rely solely on renewable electricity, we would have to increase global mining by 2,000%, which we don't realise. And it's the waste from the production of renewable energies, batteries, um, solar panels, it's just, it's more toxic than coal mining. It's more toxic than nuclear and um, 
as well, solar panels take four years to pretty produce the electricity to, to produce them, which if you give them a couple more years, they'll probably be broken by hail or something else, and then you've got to buy a new one, and that's manufacturing in China and yada yada yada. So, um, I think, yeah, everyone's sort of banking on renewables, and especially in the city, that's people just use up all their electricity eat food and everything from out here, from sort of the central west, and it's, sort of, it's a grounding experience for me. How do you see where the power comes from? You see where your food comes from, and you can appreciate and understand it better. And um, that's sort of, I think, a message that we as artists can transmit to people in cities and people that don't get to see that stuff every day. They don't have the privilege of getting to see that every day. And um, I think that for the community, it's sort of, we can feel a bit helpless sometimes because a lot of the decisions that are made about our jobs and all power stations and mines and industries and everything, a lot of those big decisions are made by people in cities, people that don't take the time of day to come out here sometimes and see what the effects of their decisions will be, and um, it, it is quite concerning sometimes, um, but I think just trying to get the message out there to just everyday people as well as like the community, like, not everyone knows about everything, and that's fair enough, you know, you don't want to spend your day digging out facts and boring yourself and terrifying yourself about the future, but um, I think, yeah, it's a good idea to share what the reality of our situation, the reality of the world is, so that we aren't just here with these decisions and us to just roll in the punches because we have that hint in what we will be made. I think I should say that that's, that's a really, really good point about the boring and terrifying <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> um, no, I mean, these facts and these realities that we really do need to come to terms very real way its existence I'm not sure of as well as beyond our own existence. However, that's also just the most amazing uh, uh, privilege of being able to work with artists is that there's nothing as effective as representing a problem anew, fresh, um, in, in a way that you haven't quite thought of before. And so if that's through poetics or if that's through activism, seeing it differently, it hits home in a different sort of fashion. And so, um, yes, we might be talking about large issues here that we've sort of seen maybe potentially removed from you know, not active participants. Participants in those industries, but we are active participants because we're here talking about the issues and the ideas, using public space to do that, public time to do that. And, um, and I think that's, that's really something, just the most powerful and potent uh, part of. Artists get to give us, it's a real gift, yeah, really presentation of uh, problematics. June. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I kind of want to go back to industry to, I guess, um, some of the conversation that was started at the beginning of this question about, I guess, you know, fear and, um, you know, we don't, <laughs> I think so, because you said we don't want to talk about regional artists, but I want to talk about regional artists, and I want to talk about artists and I want to talk about you know in particular the ways that you know this amazing partnership or this incredible way uh, you know with having more people sort of move out here can really be beneficial I guess to building a really strong regional art sector because I think you know there is um, across the board sort of uh, less uh, many less opportunities I guess for artists to really kind of get a career momentum going in regional locations and I think you know, even five or six years ago, a show like this just wasn't possible. Um, and because I pitched it a number of times. Like, <laughs> and I really, I really wanted it to be, um, there was a big show in the city called The Nationals, and the first Nationals um, had my regional artists. And I was like, oh, wouldn't that be cool if like, the regional galleries were like, yeah, let's like, have a show that runs the same time as the Nationals, but we'll call it the regionals. And then we'll take it to the city. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, um, it just didn't seem like people were 
else but the back a lot. Um, but it didn't seem like it was sort of an idea that the regions could be this like, or have their own sort of um, really strong identity. And I think that a lot of that comes from you know, access to uh, education, you know, even though the university allowed them to run for this war, it uh, didn't have a visual arts degree, and you know, a lot of those studio uh, courses now and the non stuff exist up there, and it's a much different course. I think Wobble Wobble still has opportunities for uh, regional people if they didn't want to go to the city to get, you know, access to those educations. But apart from that, like, if you do want to, you know, study, you have, to, you have to go to the city and a lot of regional people just can't afford it. They don't have networks, um, they don't want to be away from the communities that they really love. Um, it's, uh, yeah, just not something that was possible and that was really the case for me. Like, I um, would have loved to have gone to the city and I do still think about that. It's only a few years ago, I was like, probably that time, go to the city. <laughs> um, and that was really about what to learn, I guess how the city gets things off the ground. Um, so I uh, was a co-director for an Ari down there uh, called First Draft. And you know, First Draft had always had this sort of regional artist fund to uh, support travel. Um, but you know, what I didn't realise was that uh, it was counting anyone just away from the city. And so a lot of the travel groceries were for people from Melbourne, Perth, um, you know, a lot of other step centers, so it's just like more away from us, um, qualified you for that sort of uh, support or extra support, which you know, really actually it costs a lot to travel between the city and the country, um, and it's not an easy thing. So, sort of advocating, I guess, for people to consider what it is to be regional beyond like a measurement from the center. Um, and I think even the um, title of the show is interesting because it still places the regions, you know, in relation to the center. Which you know, I think is a really interesting concept, and I think we've got a lot of work to do out here in the regions in terms of how we build the sector and we um, offer opportunities to young artists who are out here and like really kind of bring them all in. And I think that Maddie and Jason and a lot of these artists that are moving out here have a lot, um, a, a big role to play in that um, because a lot of it is about visibility of those connections and just seeing you guys doing it is really inspiring. It is. Uh, June, could you elaborate a bit more on this uh, Night Floor project? Oh, which is really exciting just in terms of building the visual Yeah, so I guess um, it really came out of the experience of being a co director in the city and sort of seeing how applications uh, were assessed and why weren't regional artists getting, um, I guess, the visibility. Uh, even though they had been working maybe for as long a time, their careers were. You know, the same similar length they might have been practicing for, you know, five or ten years. Um, why were they not even getting into the top 50? They could be like seriously sort of discussed. And um, I met at the time that was we put together this um, Metro Arts First Draft partnership. And the artist who was selected for that is Betty Russell. She was up in this morning, was also an RE director. And we kind of got talking about that and really sort of tried to cut down what it is that would really help artists who don't have connections um, with the city to start to build and establish those uh, and to really kind of give a bit of transparency around those processes uh, and also the opportunity just to meet people so I think it's no um, surprise to me here um, that most of the artists in this um, exhibition are, have also been in the cement festival because I think the um, cement festival really gave a lot of visibility to the artists and also you know, there was that first opportunity where we got to meet people who were sort of practicing and you know, had come out from the city. And but most of those connections from that first mentor that I had were in high school, they're still, you know, my best friends. <laughs> um, I just never let them go. <laughs> um, and it was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of kind, kindness and care um, that the artists that came out through the mentor festivals. I really felt um, that there was a little bit of, you know, taking under the wing there by, by certain people in the art world. And I think, Ground floor is about trying to set up those kind of opportunities for regional artists to make those connections and to get uh, someone to look over their grants and to apply for first draft and being rejected. First draft directors are going to be out there, you can sit down with the application and have a bit of a look at what's happening, you know, pitch shows like, and talk about more sort of um, 
meaningful kind of you know collaborations between smaller regional areas, larger uh, arts organisations, and that metro regional kind of um, collaboration, I guess, because there is tension. There always has to be a tension between the city and the country in some in some ways, um, but I think it can be a beautiful friendship. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Have them time. I agree. Yes. Does anyone have any questions for our wonderful uh, panelists today? Um, we've got about five minutes or so. If you do want to ask any questions, yes. uh, comments. I guess what I've, uh, I've really enjoyed hearing you, but I'm sitting here and I'm looking at Marty's work, and the thing that um, I think is incredibly beautiful, but at first I thought I'm looking at snow falling, you know, mm -hmm. and then I hear that it's about to shine. Um, I think that's one of the um, really important things about this exhibition that you're confronted with things and then you see them in a different way and that the message can come through in a very beautiful way but um, gives you a political understanding. Same as Georgie's um, sugar tree, um, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's um, very much about occupancy and the, this beautiful Australian tree which is, is crying. Sure. Um, so I, I, I just want to have a word to say, and I don't know how. We should say, Anne's also a wonderful artist, it's the most essential, mm -hmm. the gardens of Strange, for sure, check that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Anne. I think, um, like, we don't want to aestheticize the problems, but it's sort of like a way to get people engaged. Like, I was painting last night for like 50 minutes, um, and it was a silent protest. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to, to people to experience really on a small micro level what those um, communities of experiencing out there with their silence, um, with not getting access to politicians or bigger people um, who aren't taking any accountability for the problems out there um, and not really making any active change that I know that I've seen that, that seems to be happening. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting like listening to people like hear the story from the invigilator um, when I was at focusing uh, like each fish was each one was a memorial so each one I was making sure that I was you know, like, it was people, like, I attached that to family, to ancestors, to all of us now. And, you know, like, one thing that I was thinking about today is, like, we speak about the environment, like, oh, it's an environmental problem, like, it's, like, it's, we are the environment, like, this is us, like, we're not separated from it. Like, and that's the worrying thing that I feel like, um, I don't know, isn't being taken into account enough, but, yeah, I think, like making out like this, um, it, it, it just reaches a different audience. It hits people later, people come up to me later and say, wow, like, that's what I was looking at that whole time. I was pitching it in my boundary, like, and then it's got this double, double meaning um, that sort of punches you in the face later. Um, and that resonates with you, the character. Things and what we're all 
support you, but really, is there a way that you can be more interactive and really look at the people that are not causing the problems? And it's not people that's wrong. And it's probably not the people that are doing this. It's the people that are causing strings that are manipulating all of us against each other. And I'm here. And I think that's really, really important that we don't turn on each other, that we really start to look at the big picture about what really is going on and who's pulling our strings and making us turn on each other. So we have to really think about that. Yeah, I think that, that's a very, um, yeah, it's a very good point. Um, and then that's one of the things mentioned um, with the, like, the Monkey Region Action Group. You know, they mentioned that about collective health, you know, um, and about being kind to the community. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very important, it's very difficult. Um, I, I guess, you know, from a, from a different perspective, I mean, the reality is that we're functioning and cooperating and participating in a world that thrives off divide and conquer and has historically since arguably the Great Man Empire, probably before, which loosely translates into this dominant Western model um, uh, and other models. Um, so this is the world we're living in. We're living in a world where, you know, the oldest indigenous cultures uh, are being the most oppressed people. Aboriginal people are the most oppressed people in the world. Um, but, but the divide and conquer aspect of it is like, it's an almost perfect formula. It's largely perfect. Performance. I don't want to give it 100%. <laughs> give it 99. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's still going to be home in a hopeless situation. Um, and, 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 and this, you know, my work speaks, if I had to distill this word, I would say divine conquer. You know, and so I'm trying to show a sort of historical timeline. Um, say, so, I mean, that, uh, that uh, cardboard shield there, um, for those who don't know, um, that's the legal shield. And so from the very first day of invasion, where you know, the landing party came from the tall ships. Uh, they saw two Gwigal men, and uh, the Gwigal men said, um, you know, Warra Warra Way, which loosely translates into Dull Way. And so that was the very first recorded protest in Australia. Now, how was that protest met? That protest was met from the bullet hole through the shield given the man, arguably from Captain Cook's musket, who was the highest ranking officer. So, if we look at divide and conquer from a historical lens, um, by the way, that shield is still a trophy in the British Museum, and it's become a symbol of divide and conquer. So, you know, my work is, is talking about, it's always been divide and conquer for us from day one. Nothing's changed, really. Um, and um, it's about navigating that, I guess, as best as possible, in a collective sense, always propelled. But unfortunately, you know, for us, we're, you know, 2% of the population. So divide and conquer in terms of majority rules. Uh, divide, I mean, divide and conquer is in every aspect of our lives, systemically, some more than others. Um, but it's the nucleus. It's, 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 it's such a it's such an important thing. Um, I oh, we've got time for one one last quick one. Hang on, quick one at the end. Um, hi, um, I volunteer as a receptionist here uh, from time to time, uh, and I'm. 
I'm so excited about this exhibition. I don't know, Jim, you've been trying to pitch it for a while. I'm really excited. <laughs> uh, no, I know. There's a whole lot of factors that are, you know. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, so I'm on the settler, um, British ancestry, lived here and lived in um, Sydney. And um, yeah, I know that there are going to be people coming to this exhibition who will display to the receptions on the way out. Because one of the things the receptions do is receive people's feelings about the place they've been in. Um, I've been a receptionist in a health centre, I've been a receptionist in a um, people will go, this is really good, or that's a lot of rubbish, that's not art. Um, or, you know, one two year old do that, or that kind of thing. And people are going to get really angry about this. Um, and some people will go, um, so I think um, it's just a response to what all of you are saying, what all of you are making, and uh, what the others just here that some of the audience are saying about let's try to be more of a collective. And um, I think this is part of the collective. Part of the collective is being the ship stirrer through art. I mean, that's just so beautiful and heartbreaking. And um, I, you know, because I'm on reception there, I'm still wearing my Vicky's band t shirts or whatever, but I, I don't wear, um, you know, an art t shirt that says Breaking is Rock in here because I'm going to reception at a place on my back as Richard Council and they don't, you know, I can't that legal. But, um, I'm trying to say, but yeah, the collective is, you know, I, I agree that we want to embrace all of us and we want to embrace residents, and some of the residents are going to stood in places of the artists. Um, so I think it's just, you know, look after yourselves, everybody, look after it, and each other, is what I'm trying to say, is that um, we have strength in unity, and some of that unity includes people who don't want to buy does that make sense that um, it, it's, it's, it's up to people who have awareness to try to reach people who are just like, no, if you do, for some reason, you are be leading hard while you're trying to act like you're this person. Um, and at the same time, yeah, it's like we're, you're always thinking you have to look good at it. It's incredibly powerful and wonderful. And at the same time, if someone speaks in your face, you just say, what am I about? You know, and just walk away yourself. You don't always have to be the one that gives way to the colonial violence or the capitalist violence or the misogynist violence or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I think I could say the same for the others here that, you know, all, all we're really doing is holding up the mirror to society. That's really all we're doing. Um, and yeah, I guess that's part of our role, you know, if, if we can't do that as artists, it's, it's a problem. Um, but yeah, I guess it's, yeah, it's just really neat. I think we've run, run out of time, I know we're sort of just starting to warm up here, uh, but uh, I think we're having we can go on for a very long time, but we, yeah, we have run out of time. So uh, thank you so much. Please join me in a round of applause for our incredible artists.